Hello, Taylor here. Before we start, I want to let you know that this is a shortened version of the full podcast episode. To hear all the details and all the stories, please click the links to Apple Podcasts or Spotify in the description. Thanks for listening and subscribing. Here's the show. Today on Simply Complex, we talk about how something as seemingly simple as making candy corn. I still have the sugar stains on the ceiling. I've tried scrubbing it several times. It's getting lighter, but it's still there a little bit. Can send you to the hospital if you don't know what you're doing. The gloves I use, I've heard of people try this themselves, who've gotten the sugar to splash up above the glove and go inside the glove. You burn through a tendon, it doesn't grow back. This is episode one of Simply Complex, brought to you by the team at How to Make Everything and Studio 71. Hello. So the other day, I was grocery shopping for normal food, not Halloween candy. There was this massive display of candy corn that was all set up. There was traditional candy corn, chocolate candy corn, some other weird flavors, and those pumpkins. The more I thought about it, it's such a simple candy. It's kind of bland, but it's it's just weird, like I, the texture and everything. But you tried to make candy corn last year. I did try to make candy corn last year, and it was, like usual, way more difficult as I expected, and a ton of things went wrong. In today's modern world, we are always in such a hurry. We rarely stop to think about the things that keep the gears turning. On Simply Complex, we explore the people, technologies, items, and processes that, while at one point were considered outstanding, have today become so commonplace, we take them for granted. Why did you make candy corn, Andy? Well, candy corn is kind of a divisive candy in that uh, there's a lot of haters, but I am not. I absolutely adore it. And some people, they hear that I like candy corn, so they buy me a bag of candy corn. And that's that's like really a cruel thing to do. <laughs> it's like, you, you give it to me, I'm going to enjoy it for a moment, but then I'm going to eat too much, and then I'm going to hate it and hate myself and hate you for giving it to me. Thanks. Before we talk about candy corn, too much. You actually made it from scratch. Yes, I was so inspired by my borderline obsession with it that I want to try making it myself. And I, one thing I was really intrigued about is the fact that it's a candy named after a corn, a vegetable. And it's like not really made from corn, except it kind of is because it uses corn syrup. I was like, can I actually take corn that I pick and make it into candy corn? So that was that was my hook. That's what what I started from. Did you research where candy corn came from? I did. There's not necessarily a ton of information about it. It was originally called chicken feed, and was they first made it in like the 1880s, and uh, it was bought out by this one company that eventually became Jelly Belly, and uh, just eventually kind of became associated with the harvest festival of uh, Halloween. That is way more straightforward than I imagined. Yeah, there's there's no convoluted story behind it or anything. So it seems like a simple candy, but it wasn't. No. In the history, it used to be made by hand. I was like, oh, I could do that again. But I was kind of curious to try and uh, replicate it. I think part of what appealed to me is that it's a very manufactured candy. It's very, you don't really know what's in it necessarily. Like it says there's honey in it, but not really that much. <laughs> so where I started to actually make it myself was I looked at the ingredients and, and I just kind of had to Google what a few things were and figure out what role they were playing in it and uh, figure out how I could either make that or make something similar to it. And so I broke it down. The one thing I found is that it was, it did involve a fair amount of actual corn products. You have the corn starch, which is usually used to kind of release it from a mold that you put it in. You have corn syrup. Uh, most often, it's uh, actually a high fructose corn syrup used in the place of sugar because it's generally cheaper. But I haven't figured out how to actually do that. So I also used sugar cane, as I mentioned in the video. There is there's usually some sort of coating on the outside of it, which sometimes can be made out of corn itself. And I looked into it, and it's a very complex process that I wasn't able to do. So was, I decided maybe I'll try beeswax instead. Um, then there's also usually a gelatin in it. I don't know if it, if it's in a modern recipe. I got that more from like the old recipes that they used to do. That's supposed to be what helps give it its form and texture. The colors, 
which was pretty key. The white is just the sugar itself. And that was one of the biggest challenges is that white sugar is actually pretty difficult to do. Then for then you need a yellow and an orange or a yellow and red if you know how to mix colors, which yeah. I, I got that down in kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was able to use some past things like the cochineal that I got in Mexico. And then I grew some turmeric, which uh, actually bought mostly growing um, as little sprouts. Um, but they arrived like damaged and like a week late or something because there was like a hurricane that hit just then. And uh, it looked like the box went through the hurricane. So they like, arrived dead. And I like nursed them back to life. And I uh, ended up harvesting one to make the candy corn. And the other one is in the other room by the window. Oh, that's what that is. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then you used all this knowledge and all your failures. And then you tried again later to make candy canes. Mm-hmm. I mean, this was very much a learning experience. Did a lot of things I just tried at, see what happens. So then when um, afterwards, I wanted to give it a second shot. And that's when I did the candy cane. And uh, kind of repeated a few of the same things. And then from that video, Lofty Pursuits reached out. Yeah. You know, on that video, like every third comment is like, go watch Lofty Pursuits. They actually know what they're doing. You should talk to them. Talk to Lofty Pursuits. And uh, haven't had the chance to do that quite yet, but hopefully uh, be able to do something with them. Yeah. Like, like right now. Like, yeah. Let's uh, give Greg a call. All right. First, uh, I want to congratulate you on basically being the official expert on candy making on YouTube, it seems, because I had like <laughs> almost 150 people, different people recommend I check out your channel. <laughs> so you're, you're pretty well known. Oh, right? I think that's funny. Uh, you use Victorian era uh, technology for your candy, right? I use Victorian technology and equipment and styles. And yeah, I, I got fascinated with this. Can you uh, explain a little bit how you got into that? I had somebody teaching me. This is not something you can teach by a video. I stand on the shoulders of giants. I couldn't have figured this out because so much of candy making is invisible. It's touch, it's smell, it's feel of the temperature on your face. It's using the information you have to figure out the information you can't measure. Does that make sense? Yeah. When I made mine, one of the things I did wrong was uh, getting the, the water level moisture amount wrong, right? You did. And I, one of the problems people say, give me your recipe. The recipe is sugars and water. <laughs> flavor and color is just such a small percentage it doesn't affect anything but the question is how temp high do you cook it to and i can't tell you it depends on your air pressure for me i'm adjusting it for when storm fronts come through i can get almost a three degree temperature change wow and that's enough to mess me up it's crazy you know i was noticing in the hur when the hurricane came through god it changed the boil it dropped the boiling point of water in my region when the hurricane came through by i think 14 degrees fahrenheit wow i mean that's huge yeah and then the humidity changes it also. So you can't do just time because the more humidity in the air, the less moisture can evaporate out at any given point. Do you see where I'm going? It all becomes a chain reaction. So you're constantly adjusting it, and this is why you need to apprentice. It took me about six months before I could consistently make a candy that didn't burn or didn't melt. Wow. Or didn't go liquid when you poured it. Yeah. And that's why people have gotten injured. What makes it so dangerous? Well... It's 310 degree, very tasty napalm. <laughs> it likes to spread. And if you have some water in it and the water hasn't mixed completely because you're using the wrong pot, that water wants to explode when it hits your cooling surface, make a nice bubble popping through the surface and spraying hot sugar everywhere. <laughs> if you don't pour it evenly, you can also trap an air bubble and an air bubble will rise right out. And if it's too liquidy and it explodes, you get a little spray of, well... I've gotten more third degree burns up and down my arms and a couple on my face than I'd like to admit. So have you ever tried to make candy corn yourself? No, because that's actually a different process. Candy corn is, it's a liquid process and it uses something called panning as part of it. I'm not totally sure how the center is made. I'm assuming it's a sherbet, not to be confused with the sherbet that is used for frozen sherbet here in the United States. This is the British term. It's a candy filling. It is typically made by making something, cooking something almost to hard sugar level and then beating it forever. If two people made it on one of my candy cooling tables, they would both use something resembling a hoe and they'd be pulling it back and forth for about two hours. 
Wow. And this is called a creaming of sugar, and it's how they make the center of chocolates and things like that. There's something called a ball creamer, which does this mechanically. And then you take this material and you drop it out of a funnel, usually a forced funnel, into molds. And the molds are not molds made out of metal. They're made out of cornstarch. Are you familiar with cornstarch molding? A little bit, yeah. So they take a tray of cornstarch, they press things into it, and then they drop it. This is the same way jelly beans are made. If you think about it, isn't a candy corn a lot like a jelly bean, just different flavors? Mm -hmm. So your candy didn't work because you didn't cook it hot enough. You probably didn't cook it on the right stove. And I'm going to tell you... If you did, it probably was going to crystallize down the line mm -hmm. because you didn't get enough glucose out of the corn. Mm. The way I would have done it, just to go back to this, I did send you that message back then, is I would have cooked the corn syrup to the point, or the sugar cane, to the point that it had a lot of water in it. Yeah. And then I would have filtered out the in impurities. And the traditional way to have done this is with activated charcoal, just stirring it in. But I wonder if you could use something like a Brita water pitcher if you never wanted to use that filter again. Oh, yeah. I don't know if the charcoal isn't dense enough that it won't let any of the sugars through. Hmm. But you would filter it when it was hot and the sugars were very, very liquid. Yeah. So that might get rid of the impurities and get you to something really pure. If people want to get some of your candy, are they able to buy it from your store or your website? Yep. They just go to our website, which is www.pd.net which is probably the best demonstration that I was one of the first online businesses when I sold juggling equipment off that domain name. Ah, <laughs> all right. Thanks, thanks for your time and answering my questions. Now that it's been one year since you attempted this, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts about this project, about making candy corn, totally messing it up, <laughs> and learning you messed it up. What are your thoughts? Uh, I would say it's very interesting to look back at that, because things have changed a lot in a year. First, I was doing this in my kitchen. I made such a huge mess. And uh, I feel like this project is probably what kind of pushed me towards, like, maybe I could do this somewhere else that isn't my kitchen and where I have to live. Um, so right now we're recording this in our studio, which we share with you, Taylor. Yes. Um, and we have our own little kitchen set here. We can make a mess here. And then at the end of the day, I can go home and not have a mess there. <laughs> it's really nice. Yeah. Um, I still have the sugar stains on the ceiling. I've, <laughs> I've tried scrubbing it several times. It's getting lighter, but it's still there a little bit. Yeah, still, still reaching for that elusive pure white sugar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had a property manager ask me about it. Like, is there, <laughs> is there a leak going on? About it? Like, no, no, I did that. I did that. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but then uh, also uh, just this was kind of right when I was first starting to dabble more with chemistry and was just kind of like, I know adding chemicals to this and reacting it and whatnot. I have a vague idea. Um, since then, I've, I feel like I've really gone deeper into the whole chemistry rabbit hole and like learning more about it. And I have kind of a, a complicated relationship with chemistry because there was a, a brief period in my life where I thought I wanted to major in that. Honestly, just because uh, I took a chemistry class, I was good at it, and a teacher wrote career candidate on my report card. And oh, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And I saw that. I was like, eh, okay. <laughs> but it fueled the curiosity that's led to this. Yeah. So then I took a bunch of classes in chemistry, and I just didn't have a passion for it. I found a passion more in uh, filmmaking and storytelling. And I feel like that's somehow gone full circle now, and I'm suddenly uh, I'm doing filmmaking about chemistry. Uh, <laughs> it all uh, works out. <laughs> well, we should probably wrap this up. Uh, right. This was super cool. I learned something today besides all the science. <laughs> Thanks to Lofty Pursuits for helping us out. Such a great conversation. We have a podcast coming out every week now. Uh, and so stay tuned, subscribe, tell your friends, especially if they like candy, especially if they like Andy. And if you want to know more behind the scenes of what happens if you try to make everyday stuff on your own. Thanks for subscribing and listening. See you next time. So we're about to record another podcast, but on my way to the studio... I decided that I'd get Andy some candy corn because I'm just about to finish wrapping that up. So 
We'll see what he says. Hey, Andy, I did get you something. Oh, no. <laughs> I warned you about this. <laughs> no. Yeah, so I got chocolate. Yeah, one's like a mixed bag. One's chocolate, and one's like original. Oh. They make chocolate candy corn? Yeah. I'm a purist. It's, it's gotta be regular. I know. I know. Like, I didn't get any other flavors, though. It seemed like they didn't have as much as I remember. But yeah, I'm gonna take a bag and I'll leave the bag out of here. <laughs>